I'm very happy and grateful to be here today with you to talk about Bitcoin and the innovation of decentralized ledger technologies, and then a bit about the impact that this has on other macro trends. My name's Elise Colleen. I'm a venture capital investor and have been for the past two and a half years. Previously, I studied and worked in the field of psychology and conducted research in the field of the life sciences. But today, I'm focused on investing in entrepreneurs. We back the women and men that are pushing culture forward through technology innovation. And one of the things that excites me most about being here today and about the Bitcoin community generally is the entrepreneurs that exist around it. So this morning, I'm gonna talk about the confluence of the movements of Bitcoin, the sharing economy, and the internet of things. And then I'll talk also a bit about the psychology that underlies and supports these three networks. So if you use Bitcoin today, you're an early adopter. There's approximately 5 million people that use or own Bitcoin out of an easy 2.5 million potential users with internet access globally. So my own expectation for growth in the Bitcoin ecosystem, the jump from 5 million users to a billion users, is strengthened by Bitcoin's very timely al uh, alignment with the trends of sharing economy and the internet of things. And I believe that the complementary nature of these three movements, by which I mean the technological infrastructure, the psychology that underlies and drives each network, and the cultural route will work in such a way that each movement will catalyze the global penetration of each of the others. Let's begin, though, by defining the move, these three movements. The sharing economy is the existence or establishment of networks or marketplaces for the purpose of collaborative consumption or collaborative creation. And that's the creation or consumption that exists between peers. It's not internet dependent and certainly existed before the presence of the World Wide Web, but the web has been used to create global scale and sharing economy. It's a marketplace, importantly, in which consumers are on both sides of the transaction. And it's a marketplace that's centered on the need for access to a resource versus ownership of the resource. The Internet of Things, a term uh, coined by Kevin Ashton at the end of the 20th century, refers to the connection of the internet to the physical world via ubiquitous sensors. And we see in our mobile phones, our smartwatches, or our fitness trackers, for example, the presence of the internet of things in our lives today. And with the introduction of Bitcoin, the overlap between the sharing economy and the internet of things begins to occur. So just as the sharing economy and the internet of things are not new, neither is digital currency as a concept. There have been valiant efforts and absolutely brilliant work done on the problem that date back to the origination of the World Wide Web. However, Satoshi's innovation of a protocol that prevents the double spend of tokens or, or digital currency allows us to have a blockchain protocol that fundamentally is a trust not needed network for people to interact and transact upon. So now that we have a now that we can outsource trust to miners, to nodes on the network, the sharing economy can expand to include transactions between unfamiliar people and between autonomous connected devices as well. And so this reinforces the idea of both economies that transactions can occur between unfamiliar people on both sides of the transaction and between connected devices. And why this is important is that we live in a global economy that's been increasingly wired for communication. But what's missing is what Bitcoin and the blockchain provide, and that's the ability for the connected village to transact and to share. So prior to Bitcoin and to Bitcoin's more ubiquitous, or the blockchain's more ubiquitous adoption, in order to transact, we're reliant upon third-party uh, verification. So the global internet economy is gated, and necessarily so to prevent us from facing the financial repercussions of fraud. 
Traditional financial institutions are the gatekeepers here, certifying the online trustworthiness of internet users. But needing to protect their own downside, they've excluded most people from the global economy and from the sharing economy as well. The organized sharing economy, um, though, is even more restrictive than uh, commerce. Here, not only do financial institutions gate access, but social media platforms, and namely Facebook, act as a measure of reputation that determines a person's ability to participate in the sharing community. As a result of these restrictions, we become prohibited from transacting with the 2.5 billion adults that are unbanked globally, and we're prohibited from sharing with the 6 billion people not on Facebook. So this doesn't match now culturally with where we are. It doesn't fit the psyche of the masses anymore. And things began to change in 2008. This was the year when Mother Nature and the economy very loudly said no to hyperconsumption that we had become addicted to. And at the same time, from what seemed to be a smaller corner of the world, the Satoshi White Paper was published. That was less than two months after the fall of Lehman Brothers. The 2008 global recession fundamentally changed consumption and, ver and uh, very distinctly changed a younger generation's views on their own consumption. People, especially millennials and Generation Z, came to see themselves as users and as makers and much less as consumers. What the recession did was also make very transparent our connectivity to each other the connectivity that exists between nations and between socioeconomic groups, even though these groups are generally unfamiliar with each other. It became apparent that we're connected via our dependence and reliance upon institutions. But what the Satoshi White Paper showed us was that blockchain innovation allows us to securely connect to one another peer-to-peer -peer in a way that we control ourselves without the institution as an intermediary or a gatekeeper. And in this way, we gain access to the sharing economy. The gig economy is a piece of the sharing economy, and that is the renting or sharing of resources that you own in order to generate alternative streams of revenue or of income. And today, this is generally dependent on established marketplaces like Airbnb, Lyft, Liquid Space, which is a marketplace for sharing dormant office space, or TaskRabbit to rent your time. Earlier methods, in fact, of mining the blockchain using dormant CPU and GPU power are actually examples that fit here in the gig economy. So it was, the f and, and in addition to that, was the first example of tokenizing a shared uncommon resource. A trust, so as we unlock the dormant resources that surround us, opportunities for efficiency in the global economy um, are revealed. But in order to do this, the trustless protocol of transaction that is decentralized ledgers is key. And it's key both to, gro to general growth and to the acquisition of global users in both the seats of, of nodes and of users that rely upon those nodes. And in the circumstance where reputation is important, as I mentioned, it is at times in the sharing economy. For instance, when you're sharing higher valued goods, we can replace social media gateways with escrow services, multi-sig, smart contracts, or other yet to be designed decentralized solutions. In terms of access to shared resources, the peer-to-peer -peer economy for common goods, which I'll define as those goods that we've become accustomed to sharing, is benefited by Bitcoin in the very same way that e-commerce is benefited. We can now transact without regard to a third party's sanction, and so the marketplace opens up. We can have more users. However, the sharing economy is invigorated by Bitcoin innovation in several other ways, thanks to the ability of digital tokens to represent stored value. So we can break down tokens into two categories. First, network agnostic currency like Bitcoin, which are meant to be used cross-platform and for multiple purposes. And next, the specific, uh, a, a network-specific digital currency or token, such as Safecoin, that can be used only within the network it was earned, 
or transfer or if transferable can be traded on an exchange. If it's fair to consider USD or the Singapore dollar as a stored um, representation of stored labor, as economist Adam Smith has called it, then Bitcoin is stored compute power. And so how this works is that you, you commit work that creates value, represent this value as a digital currency like Bitcoin, or more traditionally in the form of a fiat currency and then are able to store your labor in this way to use it when, when necessary or when convenient to you. Originally though, I believe that Bitcoins fun functioned primarily as a symbol that concretely tracked a miner's contribution to a network rather than as a way of um, producing income for those nodes on the network. The utility of Bitcoin here to track the contribution of miners was likely a more powerful tool to incentivize than was Bitcoin's use as a currency. So prior to Bitcoin gaining the power of pr purchasing power and pri prior to it gaining um, high monetary value or significant value, it had the ability to symbolize and track contribution and that worked to psychologically motivate the network. Now, Hal Finney alluded to this on November 13, 2008 in response to a forum question about method of network incentivization. And what he said was that if the system turns out to be socially useful and valuable, node operators will be motivated to participate. On average, the Bitcoin reward to miners is based on the percentage share of total network power that a miner contributes to the network. So in this way, representing CPU resource as a token, which is the exchange of Bitcoin for the, the original CPU power, miners were able to assess concretely the community's progress, their contribution to that progress, and their standing in the community, or at least they were able to guess at this. And so this incentivized the network to contribute, the nodes to contribute, and catalyzed the robust development of a peer-to-peer -peer network. And it also showed the collaborative creation that is the ethos of Satoshi. The system was aligned with the values and interests of com contributors, and therefore the, token, the tokenization of the resource provided to the system, the necessary resource, worked to incentivize participation. And this was true even before sufficient li liquidity existed in the exchange to create a market demand and to price the resource. So in the example of Bitcoin and the blockchain that I've been using, the increasing monetary value of Bitcoin, of the token of Bitcoin, actually changed the collaborative economy and the mining network. And it changed from a gig economy in which secondary streams of income were provided by, to miners, and it turned it into a, a principal specialized job for which specialized equipment was necessary and dormant resources of CPU and GPU power were no longer competitive. While the rise of the sharing economy has made us more familiar with sharing common resources like cars, knowledge, or time, we're still surrounded by dormant resources as we were surrounded by C dormant CPU and GPU power. And we've been unable to share these resources because they weren't able to be represented by a token. So in order, to share resor in order to share resources of any type, the portion of the resource shared has to be able to be material re materially represented. So what this looks like in common uh, sharing economy marketplaces, like Airbnb, is if you list a room in your apartment to share, you price it by day. And if you list your car, for instance, to share and get around, your contribution is priced and paid by hour. But for resources that we're not, that we're not yet um, familiar with sharing or that are of minimal value when they're priced by the common unit of hours or days, and I'm referring to these resources as uncommon resources, the ability to represent the portion of the unit shared in fiat currency is not likely not incentivizing. So for instance, if Satoshi had offered to pay network nodes a fraction of a cent for a CPU cycle, would that have created the robust network that developed? Using a token to represent these types of uncommon resources will let us share much more of the dormant resources that surround us 
by properly incentivizing the network. And so things like power, storage space, bandwidth, or energy creation can be shared. And this is where we begin to see the ability for the sharing economy and the Internet of Things to overlap. So how do we tokenize uncommon resources? Owners of the scarce resource, the scarce and valuable resource, get compensated in a token that is in proportion to con their contribution to the total network. And at the same time, that token is needed to access the network by users. If the token can be purchased in addition to being earned, then price discovery happens. And we'll begin to know what it costs to access the uncommon resource. If a finite amount of tokens exist in the network, such as is the case in Bitcoin, then network, as network usage increases, so does the market value of the resource. And so what happens is a life cycle of the token emerges. And this is what we saw with Bitcoin, and I believe we'll see when we tokenize other uncommon resources. So first, the token exists as a symbol of contribution and uh, generates incentive in the network in that way. Next, the resource, once the token can be traded on an exchange and represents some value um, relative to fiat currency, then supplementary income can be generated and a gig economy emerges. Then, as greater demand for the resource um, begins to be seen, the token becomes more valuable and becomes a form of principal specialized income. Another scenario also exists, and that is that the token could be used to exchange extra resources you have now for access to those resources in the future when you need them. So the impact of tokenizing a resource is profound. And I believe it's profound primarily because it allows us to realize a market-driven price for access. People that need to access a resource and therefore need to make the choice between owning or purchasing that resource or accessing that resource by sharing it at a specific time and when they need it, now may discover the price of access, and this is something new, generally new. The dependable understanding of the price or obstacle to access makes ownership obsolete, or at least it makes it less necessary. So ownership today is motivated by the need for consistent access to a resource, but the tokenization or digital currency pricing of that resource will provide people the same consistent access that they would have other that they would otherwise have through ownership. So specifically for the Internet of Things, the tokenization and price discovery of a resource allows connected devices now not only to exchange data as they have copiously been doing, but allows them to transact in the same or similar way by purchasing and selling resources to one another. The economic analysis and incentive for this to occur previously didn't exist, but as resources become tokenized, that quickly changes. So how, how would this look? A few conditions need to exist before devices can transact on the blockchain. First, the device needs a unique identity on the blockchain, and it also needs to be connected to communicate. The device also needs to have some sensory ability and it, or the representation of that. So it needs to be able to have vision, to hear, to smell, or to, to touch. And the device needs to be able to respond to a rule set set by the device owner. So when devices begin to share resources, the parameters of the token used to, to price that resource become very important. Two things in particular become important in terms of parameters, and that's the speed of transaction or acceptance of the transaction and the cost. So w when devices uh, connect and interact and exchange data, this happens instantaneously, and we're used to interacting with our devices like that. And I believe we'll also expect for them to transact in this way. So transmission speed has to be very quick. Next is the cost. Transaction fee will have to be very low, as the unit price of shared resources will also generally be low. And human beings make decisions um, about purchases based upon, frequently based upon, the transaction fee and what percentage of the total cost it represents. So we, percent, we expect a low transaction fee regardless of the size of the transaction. And so in this case, 
we see that Bitcoin isn't necessarily the perfect token for every network. The parameters have to fit. So back to Bitcoin. With the sharing economy emboldened and the level of what can be shared taken down to the device resource level, the virtuous cycle of efficiency emerges, and that results in less waste, broader and much more inclusive access to resources, and more time and capital free to commit to innovation or to other pursuits. Further, the value of Bitcoin and decentralized ledger technologies is fortified, as is the value of the token system. So one question the Bitcoin community has been faced with is, is Bitcoin's value marked against uh, growth of merchant acceptance? And Bitcoin's application to the sharing economy makes the answer a clear no. The sharing economy shows that a token is valuable if it is valuable to those in your network, literally. So the sharing economy isn't about merchants, it's about peers. And a currency or token that your peers accept or adopt by nature becomes a token of value to you. And this truth is evident in the sharing economy. A first place where we saw this was with Dogecoin and its deep digital penetration um, and value within a given community. So quickly to conclude, we're moving away from dependence on ownership and assets for a sense of identity, and we're moving towards defining ourselves by our networks. The ability to know and price access replaces, it gives us the ability to replace access through sharing um, for ownership. And the tokenization of shared resources and use of a decentralized ledger for payment is the backbone to this movement. Thank you for sharing with me this morning or for listening to me share this morning about the confluence of Bitcoin, the sharing economy, and the Internet of Things. I'm excited this afternoon to hear more about what you're working on yourselves. Thank you. Any questions? Name, company, and question. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Alexander. I'm from CoinPip. I've met you before, Elise. Thank you for uh, this wonderful perspective, uh, this fresh perspective on Bitcoin. Uh, the question I have is, um, you know, you, you mentioned in your talk about Bitcoin is not the perfect token for every resource. Uh, right. But, but the common uh, denomination that every resource would need is liquidity in that uh, right. token. Um, so at what point does it become, uh, does, does, does the tokenization become so illiquid, like to the extreme where you create an Elise coin and, and Elise mm -hmm. coin is going to monetize on the time that you speak at a conference, for example, uh, at, at what point does it does uh, do? I mean, how many tokens can the system take, which provides enough liquidity and there's enough shared understanding of of that token? Um, right. So I think the first thing is so the most important thing is what do people need access for, and what would they consume through ownership? and seeing how ownership can be replaced with access because we can share once units shared are represented by tokens. So in your specific example of a lease coin for time speaking at conferences, we'll begin to see how that's valuable with the release of Tatiana coin that's happening, I believe later this month or maybe in even in a even as soon as a week or two. So Tatiana is a speaker with a large following in the libertarian community, and she'll create a coin which will allow access to like special privileges at concerts. So that would be like time with her or special goods. Um, and so that will, be, that will be launched and we'll see if there's liquidity in the market and if people value those tokens. But the experiments to test that are happening now. Thank you, that's all the time we've got.